Hi, everybody. Hello, hello. Happy Friday. I'm gonna hang on just a minute here until, um, I don't know, we'll wait, wait a minute or two so that people will have time to join. If you're here already, let me know who you are, where you are, where are you watching from today? I'm in Santa Fe today. Um, I'll be here this week and next week. If you're watching, let me know where you're watching from. We'll get started in just a minute. All right, very good. All right, so today we are going to be talking about back pain. Um, you probably have seen that I'm doing a series of videos about back pain this month. Um, about every other day we're publishing um, a new short video about different types of back pain. And um, last week, I think I talked about back pain a little bit. Oh yeah, last week in the live stream, I talked about what I will and won't teach um, on my YouTube channel. And one of the things that I talked about um, that I feel is not appropriate to teach, um, I don't know, this is kind of, it's subtle and nuanced, but one of the things that I feel is not you know, entirely responsible to teach um, on my YouTube channel is about yoga for back pain. And I do have one um, gentle yoga for back pain video that is out there. Um, but it's a very, very gentle and basic video that's safe for just about everybody. And I don't feel comfortable going beyond that because, and this is why I put together that series of videos that I'm doing this month. Um, the reason is that there are very many different types of back pain. And so a yoga practice that's appropriate for one kind of back pain may be completely inappropriate for a different kind of back pain. So, um, you know, with my background as a yoga teacher and a yoga therapist, for me, it's very important that I'm teaching the right kind of practice to the right kind of person. And when I put a video out on my channel, I don't know, you know, who's watching and I don't know what they have going on with their body. So in that sense, it's better from my perspective um, to figure out how to customize the practice for, you know, each individual person who has back pain. All right, let me get into that in just a minute. But before I go any further, I just want to tell you that I'm not feeling super well today. I um, had my second COVID shot on Wednesday, and somehow I have, um, I'm one of the unlucky ones who has uh, gotten all of the symptoms or the side effects of that second COVID vaccine. And so I have a bit of fever. I'm like really hot. I might even be sweating a little bit. Um, and I'm a little bit nauseous at the moment. Um, thankfully, right now, I'm not having a headache or body ache um, because I took some Advil. But anyway, if I'm a little bit more subdued than usual, it's because of that. Um, I'm also not thinking super duper clearly. So please bear with me if I'm a little bit slow getting some of my ideas out. Oh, okay, so let's get into the back pain a little bit. Um, so I was talking about how, um, you know, how... Ideally, when a person has back pain, especially if they have back pain that's due to something related to their spine, like for example, a bulging disc or a degenerated disc or um, like spinal stenosis or um, like, um, what do you call this, sciatica due to something related to the nerves and the spine rather than a muscular issue. If it's one of these more um, like skeletal types of back pain, I feel it's really important to, to give a customized practice. If you're having back pain due to poor posture or if you're having back pain due to like muscle soreness or strain or something like that, like a muscular issue, probably, you know, uh, yoga practice is going to be perfectly fine for you. Any Pretty much any yoga practice will be okay so long as you follow, you know, the concept of ahimsa and you're practicing in a way that is comfortable for your body. Um, so, okay, I'm going to stand up here in just a minute because the AC came on and I know that's pretty loud. But while I do that, if you have any specific questions about back pain, any like if you're experiencing some kind of back pain, um, I'm hoping that today, let's see how it goes, how, you know, how much participation I get uh, for this. but. 
one thing I was hoping that we can do, do, do today is something like uh, a call-in show kind of idea where you, you type in your comment and tell me what kind of back pain you're dealing with and I can give you some ideas, some customized ideas about you know, what you specifically should be working on to help work on your back pain from a yoga perspective. So if you're having back pain or if you've had back pain before and you want any advice about it, you can type it into um, the chat here. I'm going to get up for just a second and turn off the AC and I will be right back. All right, I'm back. Okay, no comments yet. So I'll, I'll keep talking to you. Um, I did have um, one comment that um, Jocelyn wrote. I'm not sure where she wrote it. Jocelyn is part of my Patreon community. And she was saying that through her yoga practice, um, most of her back pain has been alleviated. And in fact, that's something that I hear a whole lot. Like people who have minor back pain, uh, you know, due to posture or, you know, some of the things like I was talking about earlier. Um, very frequently people start practicing yoga and within like, you know, a week or two weeks or a month, suddenly they're so surprised to realize they don't have back pain anymore. And that's awesome. So that's what Jocelyn has experienced. Her back pain, like, you know, most of the time is is now it's no more. But when she's going for a walk, she's experiencing back pain. I don't remember exactly the details, but she was saying like about 10 minutes into the walk, ah yes, her upper back and neck start to hurt. And then about 20 minutes into the walk, her low back and hips start to hurt. And she was hoping for a kind of yoga practice that she might do before walking to help, you know, for that pain to not happen while she goes for a walk. And so I don't, I don't know if um, Jocelyn happens to be here right now, but um, when I get, you know, this kind of information, like I'm going for a walk and then my back starts to hurt, I have, like, I need more information. I need to ask some extra questions. So one thing I'd like to know is how long you've been practicing yoga. Um, just how long you've been practicing yoga. If you've been practicing um, yoga that's appropriate for you for probably two or three months, then I would expect that, um, you know, the back pain, even while walking, should start to reduce. If you've only been practicing yoga a short time, you know, then it would be understandable that the back pain um, is, you know, possibly continuing at this stage. Um, and the next thing that I would want to know, and, you know, some of this um, kind of work is, is work that I do one-on-one -on -one through my yoga therapy coaching sessions, um, because it's important, like, one thing I'd want to know with Jocelyn is, what her posture looks like, like what her posture looks like when she's doing her regular activities, like sitting and standing, and also what her posture looks like while walking. Because sometimes uh, when we're walking, like for example, if you're hiking, I've been doing a lot of hiking since I've been you know, on the road these past few weeks. When we're hiking, or like if you're walking in a city, you have to be paying attention to where you're going. Like if you're in a city, you need to make sure uh, you know, that you're crossing the street at the correct time, that you're not going to get hit by a car, you know, that you're mindful of the other pedestrians or like cyclists, if there's any cyclists on the path where you're walking. Um, and if you're hiking, you're paying attention, like, you know, is this a rock? Okay, do I step on the rock or next to the rock? Or is it downhill or uphill? You know, is there a cactus next to me? Do I need to be careful of that? And so when we're walking, we're paying attention to all these details to keep ourselves safe. And guess what? We're so focused on keeping ourselves safe on the walking path that we're not paying attention to our posture while we're walking. And so one thing that we possibly can do and Jocelyn can possibly do while she's walking is, you know, experiment with walking in some place that's safe and doesn't have too many obstacles, like maybe on a school track or something like that. And rather than paying attention, I mean, because she doesn't need to pay attention to where she's stepping, she can pay more attention to her posture. So she can notice, you know, am I walking upright? Are my shoulders relaxed down? Is my head in a good position or am I reaching it forward? Am I using my, my abdominal muscles? You know, it's kind of like a, a meditation on walking. If you're, you know, walking and paying attention to your posture in this kind of way, there's all let me not go on too much of a tangent here, but there's all different kind of walking meditations. And if you're a person who has back pain while you walk, I would suggest that you might consider 
a um, body focused walking meditation where you're really focusing on your posture. Um, yeah, those are the main, like in Jocelyn's, you know, scenario and the back pain that she's experiencing, those are the main things that I would, um, you know, look into first. And then depending on what we find out um, about her posture and like where she's walking and what she's paying attention to, how long she's been practicing, once I would have um, like some answers or feedback to those questions, then we can start to look at, you know, what's next, what's next to help Jocelyn deal with her back pain. All right. So we have Maritza Benitez here, and she's had three epidurals from three C-sections, and she has low back pain to the point she can't sit on the floor for too long. Yeah, okay. Yeah, epidurals and having babies can, oh, yeah, I've had, I had one C-section. My first baby was um, an emergency C-section, and so I have some idea of what you're talking about, but you've done it three times, and so you know, a more, um, not advanced, not extreme, I don't know, you've done, you know, had more of, of that experience than I have, but I have an idea what you're talking about. So in my personal experience, you know, with my body and with other um, experience I've had working with other moms, when we have had a baby, um, actually, regardless of how the baby was born, if it was born vaginally, or if it was born by C-section, in either situation, the abdominal muscles get stretched out. The added challenge with the C-section is that the muscles are actually cut. And so, you know, even after my one C-section, it's been really, really difficult to for those for the muscles to heal back together properly. Uh, I I don't know. I don't know if everyone experiences this. You can tell me, Maritza, what's your experience, but it took a long time for me to have any sensation around the whole C-section area, like touching it. Like I knew I could see my finger touching, but my abdomen didn't, couldn't feel any sensation in that region. And so, you know, once they cut the muscles and if you lose sensation like that, it's very difficult to um, like reestablish your core strength. It's, it's, it's a lot of work. Like <laughs> you have to number one, know, what to do and then you have to be dedicated and continue to do that work for a long period of time in order to get those muscles working again. And so if you've had a C-section three times, you know, it just becomes more and more challenging. That doesn't mean that it can't be done. Um, I would suggest, Maritza, that you can begin. There's like some different ideas that I have for you. One is you might see a physical therapist, like see your doctor, get a referral to a physical therapist and, you know, talk to them about, you know, your your three C-sections and your back pain. And my guess would be that they're going to work with you on core strengthening. From a yoga perspective or from a yoga therapy perspective, we need to start very, very gently with the core strengthening because this is my experience. When we try to, like, you know, obviously all of us need to work on core strengthening, but when we try to do something that's even a little bit too challenging, this is what happens. Like say, for example, you know, we're trying to work on the abdominal muscles. If we try to do, for example, sit-ups, say we were, you know, going to lie on the floor, bend the knees, and we're going to try to to come up and do sit-ups. If those muscles are not working, the lower abdominal muscles, they're just not going to work. They're just not going to work at all. And something else will compensate like your neck muscles will compensate to lift you up or you'll use momentum to lift you up. Maybe you'll use your um, your glutes or your back muscles or something else to help you accomplish that movement. And so it will appear that you're working on core strengthening, but actually it's a whole bunch of different muscles, not the abdominal muscles, that are helping you to make the movement. Um, so what we need to do then is very, very gentle abdominal strengthening so that the muscles can begin to work again. Um, okay, so what we can do is, I would suggest just, this is going to maybe sound a little bit um, not helpful, but <laughs> this is really where, where to begin. We need to start with breathing. So when we inhale, I'm inhaling, <laughs> when we inhale, the abdominal muscles kind of relax and expand. And when we exhale, the 
you know, everything contracts. The abdominal muscles will help with the contraction. Uh, you know, like the ribs contract in, the diaphragm moves up. You know, there's these are all the muscles of uh, the muscles of breathing, the muscles of the exhale. So there's a natural engagement that happens with the abdominal muscles when we breathe. So, Maritza, what you can do is just when you do your breathing practice, and you can do this lying down or sitting down, I would guess that lying down will be better for you for right now with your knees bent. Um, inhale normally. And then when you exhale, concentrate on the muscles. I'm closing my eyes because I'm concentrating on the muscles in the lower abdomen so that you start to get them to participate. You start to get them to be able to do something. Sometimes, and I hear this very frequently, and it's happened to me too, we have the idea that we want to contract the abdominal muscles, but it, they won't do anything at all. You know, and especially I think after a C-section or multiple C-sections, we have that experience where the muscles won't participate. They just won't do what your brain is asking them to do. And what we need to do is we need to rebuild the communication between the brain and those muscles so doing a very gentle and simple movement, like, you know, just the breathing and concentrating on, okay, now I'm exhaling and the abdominal muscles are contracting and they're coming in. This is a good, safe place to start working on your strengthening. First, establish that communication between your muscles and your abs. And then once you have that, then you can start to, you know, gradually start ramping up on stronger um exercises or movements or postures or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, thank you all for being here and having the patience to listen to that whole explanation. It's, it's a lot of work to rebuild abdominal strength, especially after pregnancy and C-section. It's not, there's no quick and easy fix. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you have to know what work to do and then you have to have the persistence and the motivation to do it for a long period of time so that you can recover from, you know, that muscle imbalance. Um, yeah, it's not, I don't know, like, I feel like, like, uh, you know, very frequently, frequently we want a quick fix, but it, it takes time. It takes, it takes a lot of time. Um, I talk, I've talked before, I'm going to just kind of go on a little bit of a tangent and then I'm going to come back because I see some more comments here. Um, when I hurt my back during my second pregnancy, I, I hurt my SI joint and I was living in pain for about eight or nine years, probably like eight years, until I found the right physical therapist who could help me do the work. And uh, she told me like very early on in our work together. Uh, so what happened with my SI joint is that it was hypermobile. There was too much movement, you know, in the back part of the pelvis. And um, she told me, that it takes, I forgot exactly the number, but it was 200 and something days for the connective tissue to become stiffer. In other words, you know, me as a yoga teacher and doing all the flexibility work that I had been doing, you know, all those years had actually helped to make my back problem worse. And so what I needed to do actually was reduce my flexibility. And, you know, when I heard that it was going to take 200 plus days to solve the problem, like to really, really solve the problem, I realized that I was in it for the long haul. Like, you know, it was going to take a lot of work over a long period of time. I mean, it wasn't even a lot of work, just a little bit of work every day over, you know, basically a year. Um, and now I don't have that back pain at all anymore. So the abdominal strengthening is kind of like that. Expect that it's going to take a long time. But, you know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel and it can get better. Okay, so let me come back over here. Yeah. Maritza is saying, yeah, like I was suspecting that you don't have any sensation in that region for a long, long time, you know, after having had a C-section. I think mine was at least one or two years, and that was just like like no sensation for one or two years after a single C-section. And Maritza says that she still doesn't have sensation, and her oldest is 15. So yeah, like I would count from the date of the most recent C-section and see how long you know, hopefully that sensation will at some point return. Yeah, pregnancy and, and childbirth really, really 
um, do a number on your body. <laughs> We're never the same, <laughs> never the same after having kids. Um, okay, actually, let me, um, I, I kind of went through the whole thing, but I, let me get to the end, the conclusion of, you know, the abdominal strengthening and that whole um, story. So once we are able to access our abdominal muscles, in other words, that communication that I was talking about between the brain and those muscles, and we're able to start strengthening them, then the body can start to move in a more correct and healthier way um, so that the back muscles will relax and, you know, not be in pain anymore. Um, let me explain this too. So when I was talking to you about compensation, right, like I talked about the example of doing the sit-up and you're trying to do the sit-up, but your abs aren't working. So there's a whole bunch of other muscles that kind of chip in to help you do the work. When our, so take that principle and then think about um, low back pain due to not having enough strength in your abs. When we're walking around doing our life, you know, just walking around and doing our activities of the day and our abdominal muscles are not working, like they're not communicating with the brain, they're not strong enough, they're not doing their job, something else has to compensate. And when the abdominal muscles are not walk, uh, working correctly, often the compensating muscle or the muscles in your low back, sometimes um, also like your glutes and around your pelvis. And so if our abs aren't working, it's very normal and very common that we end up with low back pain or pain around the hips and the, and the pelvis. So, you know, theoretically then, once we start to strengthen the muscles, the abdominal muscles, then the abs are doing their job. They're like pulling their weight. And so then your back muscles don't have to do that compensation. And then, you you know, they relax. And so you don't have that pain in your back. Hopefully that all makes sense. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot to process. If you have more questions, let me know and I can explain, um, you know, in a different way. All right. Caroline is here and she says, a sudden lower back pain where it started while taking a step. I wasn't able to walk without pain. Yeah. Completely stopped yoga after daily practice for three months, but want to start again. Okay. I think I need my glasses on my face. Let's see. Make sure that I'm understanding that really well. Sudden low back pain while taking a step. Yeah, that happens sometimes. Or like when twisting, that's another time that people often get a low back pain unable to walk without pain. Yeah, I wonder, okay, so Caroline was doing, I wonder if you say Caroline or Carolyn. Um, let me know if you easily can. Um, so you were doing daily yoga practice for three months and then that injury happened, the sudden low back pain. I wonder about, um, Hmm. Your strength, I wonder about your fitness, like are you strong? Um, if you can share, let's see, line, Caroline. Okay, good, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know, I'd love to talk with you to ask you some more questions and know about your, um, uh, you know, your, your strength and your fitness and if you have any other stuff going on in your body. Um, yeah, I would suggest like when we have a sudden pain uh, in that acute phase, we need to rest. We should rest for as long as we need to, to let that pain kind of calm down. Um, you know, if you talk to your doctor, they may suggest that you take like Advil or ibuprofen or something like that during that acute phase when you have um, that kind of, you know, that initial pain, which is often due to inflammation. And then after it's calmed down, then you know, same thing, we want to work on strengthening, but it needs to be the right level of strengthening for you so that the right muscles are getting strengthened and it's not just like a compensation kind of strengthening that's happening. Let me see what's going on here. You're pain-free now. Okay, good. But wondering how to restart your practice. Okay, good. So start gently. Um, start gently. Are you, are you mainly doing my videos? Are you doing any other kind of yoga practice? Okay, um, I'll wait for you to answer that. Yeah, so start gently. Um, I would definitely put some focus on abdominal strengthening. You also can do the, like what I was describing for Maritza, which is laying on the floor, focusing on breathing, making sure that um, like you're paying attention to your abdominal muscles and, uh, and having them contract on your exhales. 
um, since, okay, uh, let me finish that uh, thought and then I'm going to read over here. So, um, you know, the breathing can be a good start. Um, lying down uh, postures uh, can be a great way to work on abdominal strengthening in a safe way, you know, without, excuse me, without causing, uh, like, without overexerting yourself. So you can do things like, um, one thing that's very nice is when we're in a lying down position, you'll have seen me do this in some of my videos, um, lying down with the knees bent, feet close to each other. Let's pretend these are legs um, and these are the bent knees. So we can do inhale, one knee goes out toward the side, exhale to the center, and then inhale, other knee out toward the side, exhale to the center. And to be very clear, and I'm gonna explain this in quite a bit of detail, so bear with me. Sometimes we do this kind of movement for hip mobility. And so in that case, we want to bring the knee all the way out toward the side as far as we can. That's not what we're working on right here. What we're talking about for abdominal strengthening is engaging your abdominal muscles. Um, you can think about engaging the muscles so that your pelvis is stabilized and you're not going to be rocking side to side while your legs go out. So we engage the abs in that way. And then we give ourselves a little bit of challenge by moving the legs. So we're trying to stabilize the pelvis. We bring the one knee out toward the side, not too far, just a tiny bit to give yourself a bit of challenge and then bring it back in. And then same thing on the other side. And when we're working on abdominal strengthening, we wanna make sure that we don't overexert ourselves. We already talked about the compensation. So that means that you don't wanna go and lie down and do 10 of these, 10 rounds of this knee movement. It's too much. This is what you want to do. And this is, you know, what I consider to be advanced practice because you have to really, really be mindful and pay attention to what you're doing. When you bring the one knee out and back in, uh, other knee out and back in, your muscles are going to start to become fatigued. At the point where you realize I have lost my muscle engagement, you have to stop and take a break. Take a break for a while and then maybe try one more round and see, you know, how many can I do? Really pay attention to when your muscles are just tired and done and then stop. And then the next day you can do it again, do one round or two rounds, go as much as you can. It's not a race, you're not in a competition. You don't need to do the maximum number possible. You only need to do how many you can do until your muscles fatigue and then you just stop. <laughs> That's how we start to work on the abdominal strengthening in any kind of situation, like Marita's situation with the C-sections or Caroline's um, situation where she suddenly had a pain while stepping one day. Um, you know, this is how we can start to work on the abdominal strengthening to help these muscles be strong so that these muscles can take a break. Okay, so Caroline was giving me some more information here. Okay, let me get my glasses back on. Uh, only following my videos? Okay, good. Yeah, so the reason I wanted to know that is because um, if you're doing, like I know I know what I teach, so I know that um, most of what I teach will be, you know, safe and appropriate uh, for people who are having back pain. You'll want to be careful, um, Carolyn, as you're getting going with your yoga practice again, to take a break, just skip any postures that are too strong. Like for example, if we're doing chair pose and say I'm teaching in a video and we're doing chair pose and say I'm doing six rounds of it, may, that might be too much. So for any posture that you're working on, same principles principle applies that if you're when, at the point when your muscles become fatigued, then just stop and take a break. That's the very best thing that you can do for yourself. Don't don't overexert. Just work to your your level and your capacity until you re regain your strength and you're 100% again. And then you can start to challenge yourself. All right, good. Oh, okay, you're doing the calendars. Perfect. Okay, very good. Excellent. Okay, let me scroll back up here and see what else people are telling me. Ah, Carla's here. I'm very tall. Things like kitchen prep work or doing dishes are the cause. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are there stretches I can do to help with yeah, okay. Let me read this carefully to make sure I'm getting your getting the details. Are there stretches I can do to help with issues of having to adjust to average size things? I see what you're saying. Okay, and I think you wrote something else down here. 
Why am I still so? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. You do need to work on ab strengthening. This happens to me too. Um, when I'm like preparing a meal that uh, takes a while, uh, lots of kitchen prep, my back will start to hurt too. And, uh, you know, my countertops are appropriate height for me, and yours may be um, too low because you're tall. So, a couple of ideas here. Yes, work on abdominal strengthening because. When the abs are not strong enough to support us, you know, in, in a posture, it's, you know, we likely will end up with um, a compensation with the back muscles and then the back muscles will start to hurt. But also it could be a good idea for you. Like we need to think about ergonomics also. So if your countertops are too low and say you're chopping vegetables or something, um, you may need to, let me think what could work here. I don't know, find something to raise your cutting board up to a height that's better for you. So, you know, maybe put, it, it would have to be something very stable and sturdy and level that you, you would place on your countertop and then put your cutting board on top to do that. Probably you can't do too much about the stove height, but um, for food prep, you might be able to do something to raise your countertops up to a level where, um, you know, a level that's comfortable. It'll probably be a little bit shorter than elbow height. Um, you don't want it too high because then you end up chopping like this and that will give you pain up here instead. Um, but yeah, think about whether there's some kind of way that you can raise your countertop up a bit for food prep purposes. I think that would help you too. Um, another thing, you know, I was talking earlier that when we're going for a walk, like in the city or hiking or any kind of walking, we have to pay attention to what we're doing so that we keep ourselves safe. In the kitchen, you know, we're really not paying attention to our posture. We're paying attention to, okay, where's the recipe? Where's my ingredient? What tools do I need? We're paying attention to the cooking and we're not paying attention to our posture. So another thing that you can do is every once in a while, just try to remember, okay, what am I doing with my body right now? Am I using it in a healthy way? Or am I, you know, so involved in the cooking aspect that I'm forgetting about what my posture is looking like and what I'm doing? So a few ideas there for you, Carla. Okay, totally train. Um, I'm wondering because I've been seeing you commenting totally train on videos, and I've been we've been kind of replying back and forth to each other. Is your name is your name train? Like, what, can you tell me your first name? I like to know people's first names if you're comfortable with it. So that I don't know, it just helps me know like who you are as a person. Totally, like sometimes people have um, usernames on YouTube. And uh, I can't tell who they like what their name actually is. So if you're comfortable with it, you can tell me what your name is. Okay, abdominal strengthening is something I struggle with. Yeah, it's not fun. Um, but you know, there's uh, I don't know. I I also don't enjoy like um, the not common popular yeah the popular abdominal strengthening. I don't enjoy it all. Um, but there. Are, very subtle things that we do in the yoga practice that provide abdominal strengthening. And I'm kind of okay with those because um, it's also a mindfulness practice. And so somehow I think it makes it more interesting to me personally. So like this thing that I was talking about with the knees is one great way to work on abdominal strengthening. Another one is, so we'll pretend these are my legs again. You can engage your abdominal muscles, stabilize your pelvis, and you can inhale, extend one leg, exhale, draw it back in, inhale, and exhale. And, you know, again, you'll want to stop when you realize your muscles are fatigued and, you know, they're not working anymore to help you accomplish this movement. Um, but also, the way that this is a mindfulness practice is when we coordinate the pace of the breath and the pace of the movement, it gives us something to pay attention to. So it's not just like, you know, what I would consider to be a boring abdominal strengthening. Rather, you know, it's like, it's almost like a meditation inhale and I'm extending and I've extended and now my inhale stops and now exhale my movement begins and then my movement is finished and my exhale finishes and so you know in that way we're training our brains and training the abdominal muscles all at the same time to me that's much more um, engaging I won't say entertaining but it's much more engaging to, to work on abdominal strengthening in that kind of way um uh Totally train has also had three C-sections. Yeah. Yeah, it really, it just, you know, it, it does, it has a very big effect on the body when we've been pregnant and or had C-sections. Yeah. So be um, 
gentle with yourself. Go slowly with your strengthening. Just really, really slowly. Be patient and know that it can get better. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Okay. So now I'm getting down to Catherine and has, Catherine has dislocated L3, L4, and L5 discs. And I find I need to stop and listen to what my body is telling me. Making me stop, close my eyes, and send my conscious breath to that area works wonders. Yeah, absolutely. That's really good. And, you know, this, again, you know, people often talk about advanced practice, and they're talking about, like, this person's able to do a handstand or a headstand, or they can, you know, do a downward-facing dog. Or, I don't know, maybe that's not a super, like, physically challenging you know, slash advanced thing. But what Catherine's talking about here, this is what I consider to be advanced practice. When we can notice what we're feeling in our body, when we can notice that we need to take a break, we need to work on breathing, we need to like really pay attention to a certain body part that's that feels different than usual, that, you know, we need to give some special attention. This is what I consider to be advanced. Okay, so dislocated the discs stop and listen to what your body's telling yeah yeah absolutely um yeah so it sounds like you know this breathing is um is beneficial and let me think if there's anything else that i can propose here that might also be helpful um you know yeah you know basically the concept of ahimsa paying attention noticing if there's any pain or discomfort and not doing the things that cause pain um when we, you know, have problems with the discs, generally strengthening is going to be beneficial because the stronger your muscles are, the better they can support your movements. And that takes um, pressure and stress off of the discs when the muscles are stronger. So if you can find, you know, the right kind of core strengthening for you, Catherine, something very gentle and subtle, um, theoretically that can help, you know, support your lumbar spine better so that these discs don't cause you trouble. Yeah, okay, good, uh, Lisa. Oh, hi, Lisa, hello, uh, very good. Okay, good, now I know that your name is Trina, perfect. No problem, no problem at all. Okay, good, um, now I know. <laughs> I love to know people's names, and ideally I like to see your faces as well because somehow, um, like, you know, pre-pandemic, when I used to teach all the yoga that I taught in, in person, you know, in my yoga studio, um, knowing the person's name and knowing their face helps me to remember your story. It helps me to remember, ah, Trina has had three C-sections and has low back pain due to, due to that. Uh, or Maritza, you know, also has had three C-sections and has loss of sensation. And that really helps me a lot, you know, in the kind of yoga that I like to teach because um, I really like to customize the practice to the person. I feel that's the most, that's the way to to provide the most beneficial yoga practice when I know what people have going on in their bodies. So I'm, you know, really happy to learn people's names. And like in my Patreon community, um, recently I... I put out a note and I said, hey, you know, everyone who's willing to have a call with me, you know, here's my calendar, please book a session with me. And I don't know if any of y'all are on right now, but when I um, have these sessions, I had one with someone this morning, one of my um, Patreon community people, and I write down, you know, who they are and I write notes about, you know, what they've got going on in their life and in their practice and in their body. And I usually also make a note about what they look like, like this person has blonde hair and bangs, or this person has, you know, whatever, I write some description so that I can remember what the person looks like. <laughs> that's maybe, I don't know if that's funny or not. I, I feel a little bit funny sharing that. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's what helps me. That's, that's what helps me, um, you know, remember people's stories. Okay, any other questions about stuff that you've got going on in your back and how to work on it or what to work on? I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. I've been talking a whole lot. I'm gonna take a sip of water. Okay, very good. This has been, um, 
I, I don't know if fun is the right word. It's been fun on my part. Um, I really like the opportunity, like having the opportunity to talk through these more subtle, advanced details of the yoga practice and the body and how to help the body feel well. Um, basically all of this that I've been talking about today is the kind of stuff that I do, and I mentioned it briefly earlier, in my yoga therapy and coaching sessions where it's one-on-one -on -one and it's very customized to what the person has going on in their body. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, um, let's see, I will put a link in the description so that you can contact me about it. It's a very different kind of way to practice yoga. You know, I think in the West, we are accustomed to yoga being something that you do in a class. And so to some extent, it's a, you know, one size fits all, you know, it can be somewhat customized in a class environment, especially if it's a smaller class. Um, and so the idea of, you know, private yoga instruction can be, it can sound a little bit weird and you might be like, what are we going to talk about for an hour? But there's lots to talk about. Um, you know, uh, what I do is, you know, really get into detail, understanding a person's background. And then I design the yoga practice um, for the person. I'm just looking around to see if I have an example of what that looks like. Um, I just wrote a practice up like yesterday. It's around here somewhere. Okay. Here's one that I just wrote for someone just to I'm going to cover the name, but just to give you an idea of, you know, what the yoga practice looks like, this is how I write it out, you know, along with d details about how many of each thing to do. So you can see like, uh, you know, this one right here is, is forward fold. So you inhale and bring your arms up, exhale, fold, and then inhale and extend your spine and then exhale, fold. I don't know if this appears backward for you, but you'll get an idea of, this is the kind of yoga practice that I put together for people who I work with um, in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Okay, let's see. I should do live on IG. I think you can do rooms with up to four people. <laughs> you know that I'm not great with Instagram. I'm, I don't even know what that, I don't even know what that means. What is a room? <laughs> um, I need someone to train me on Instagram. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to do that. Um, Thank you for the idea. I'll ask Peachy. Peachy is the lady who helps me with all my technical stuff and she does my video editing and all of that. She knows about these things. So I will, I'm going to write that down so that I can ask her. Hold on. Live on IG. Okay. Live on IG rooms. Okay, this is my shortcoming here with, you know, all of this modern uh, social media stuff. I just don't know how to use it, but I will look into it. Thank you for the idea. I appreciate it. Um, I wonder what that would give me the ability to do. Is that like small group yoga instruction? Is that how you imagine that would, that would look? If you have time, maybe we can have a call together and you can explain it to me. Okay, upper back, how can you stretch it out? That's a great question. Okay, um, let me get to Catherine's question and then I see Lisa has put one too, so I'll answer that one as well. Okay, so yeah, how do we stretch out the upper back? This is a really great question because I'm sure some of y'all have seen me talk about how all of our activities that we do are hunching activities. like. Um, driving the car, we round forward and washing the dishes and cooking the food and chopping the vegetables and carrying the children. All of it is in this direction. And we need to figure out how do we stretch out and go in this direction. So regular yoga practice of any type will help you stretch out your back so that, you know, you don't start to kind of get stuck in this kind of rounded posture and you're able to, you know, lengthen your spine as much as possible. Um, regular yoga practice. Walking actually is great for that. Um, you want to make sure that you're swinging your arms a little bit, not like in an exaggerated way. I mean, you can if you want to, but uh, I would feel self-conscious if I was walking and swinging my arms a whole lot. But that, that arm movement is really good for maintaining your mobility in your spine. And then you can do any kind of backbending posture. So when I say backbending posture, I don't mean that specific posture where you lift your belly up toward the sky and your feet and your hands are on the floor. What I'm actually meaning is any kind of posture that makes you go, you know, in this direction, this kind of 
you know, back bending or spine lengthening direction. Um, you can, one of my favorites is just to stand, inhale, bring the arms forward and up and think about lifting the sternum and then exhale down. And you'll want to do several repetitions. I would say like five or six repetitions of this. And you'll find that with each repetition that you do, it starts to loosen up and your mobility improves. You become more flexible and more able to lengthen your spine. Um, warrior A or Warrior 1 um, is also a great posture. And it's the same idea, just that your legs are, you know, one front and one back. And then you inhale, you bend your front knee, you bring your arms forward and up, lift your sternum. And you can also go this way if you prefer. Um, but anything that helps you do this is going to be great. If you saw when I was briefly showing that practice, uh, forward fold, inhale, extend your spine is also a great way to stretch out your upper back. Twists are great, like triangle with twist or lying on the floor and doing a twist or sitting and doing a twist. Those are also um, all great ways to stretch out in your upper back. Yeah, let me think of the, those are, yeah, that's, I went through those kind of quickly, but those are all um, probably, it's a pretty comprehensive list of how to stretch out in your upper back. Back spasms, yes. Okay, so yes, yoga is good for back spasms. In my experience, back spasms are typically a muscle that's mad because it's been having to do a job that it's not meant to do. So we were talking earlier about the abdominal strength. So if you're someone who frequently experiences back spasms, and sometimes they're painful and sometimes they're not, but again, I would suggest working on abdominal strengthening so that your ab abdominal muscles are doing more of the work uh, of moving your body around for your daily activities, and you're not like overusing or improperly using your back muscles because that improper use of the back muscles can lead to spasms. Yeah. I was just thinking you said, oh, to see faces, that's what that's for. Okay, okay, good. Yeah, I'll have to investigate because I can't even begin to imagine what that is. Rooms, maybe it's like a Zoom with a few people. That's what I'm imagining that it would be. Then yes, yeah, that's a great way. That's a great way to work. And you know, you know, we teach like, you know, for my studio, we do teach classes, um, live classes every day. And that's another, you know, if I can't be with people in person, um, I think teaching classes via Zoom is a, you know, it's a good second, second place because I can see the people who I'm teaching um, and see, you know, if, if they turn on their camera and if they set the camera so that I can see them, then I can see their posture also and, uh, you know, make suggestions and recommendations for alignment and things like that so that the practice will be as beneficial as possible. And all of you are welcome to come to my Zoom classes if you'd like. I'll put the link to that also in the description box after we're done chatting here. Um, but yeah, you can come to my Zoom class and you know you appear in a little window and I can see what you're doing. And so I can you know adjust my instruction to make sure that everyone's practicing in a way that is giving them the most benefit. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about those Zoom classes. So the way that they work, um, I we record the session, but we're not recording all of the students practicing. It only records the teacher. And so, you know, if you, you know, watch the recording later, um, there's a lot of information to share here. But, um, you know, when you sign up for the class, you can come to the class live or if you're not available at the time when we teach, then we also send out the recording so that you can do the class, you know, at, a, at the time that works for you. And so you'll see just me or, you know, whoever the teacher is teaching and you won't see all of the students practicing. So if you're, if you, you know, are interested in live classes, but were nervous that you were going to be recorded, please know that you're not going to appear on the recording. It's just the teacher. Um, yeah, I think that's a good way to practice. And you could, you know, like attend one class per week with me or two classes per week with me. And then on the other days, you might do YouTube videos or, you know, some combination like that. I really encourage you at least once to come and take a class, um, you know, a Zoom class with me just to see what that's like. Um, they're longer. Um, there's a, more information. It's a little bit more interactive. So, yeah, just a little bit different. And actually, um, on the last day of... 
what month are we in? <laughs> Mark, May. <laughs> On the last day of April, um, you know, in April, I had done a whole series about yoga for bigger bodies, like one video every day. And on the last day of the month, I gave out a promo code so that you could come take a class with uh, with me or with one of my staff teachers um, using that promo code. So it's free. And if you want to, you can sign up for a class. And that promo code is everybody. And it's valid until the end of this month. So you can go sign up for a class. And, you know, hopefully I'll see you there. Or you really are, you know, can come to my class or try out another one of my teacher's classes if you'd like. Um, so everybody is that code. And I'll put the link for signing up for a class in the description box. Okay, let me see what else is going on here. Um, oh, there's a new person. Let me get your, my glasses on. Do you say Tomar? I hope that's correct. I'm just beginning pigeon pose. Is it normal for your lower back to have a deep ache? No, not terribly. No, yeah. Okay, so pigeon is a posture that I don't often teach because it's, it's very physically challenging, but let me tell you about pigeon pose. Um, pigeon pose is a posture, in case, you know, for other people who are here and you may not be familiar with it, it's a, it's a posture that's down on the floor. You extend one leg back and the other leg is bent like this in front. So like this leg is like this and the other leg is toward the back. And typically when teachers teach this, um, they ask you to like put your hands down on the floor and lift your torso up. And that action can give a lot of pain in the low back. Is that the way that you're doing it, Tomar? With your hands down and lifting your body up? Um, there's uh, like a next level of that posture where we bend the back leg and take a hold of it. And sometimes you will have seen a posture, I'm gonna turn sideways to explain, but the one leg is in front, the back leg is extended, the knee is bent, and then we're meant to reach back and hold on to that back foot with both hands. So that one also can give you a pain in your low back. But no, you should not have any pain in your body when you're doing any kind of yoga pose. So if you otherwise are comfortable with pigeon and it's only hurting your back, um, what I would suggest is do not do the part. Yeah, okay, yeah, so Tamar is lifting up with the chest. So I would suggest don't do that part. Rather, keep your forearms on the floor so that your head and your spine are pointing forward. And I'm thinking there's a, yeah, I think there's a very good probability then that you're not going to have any pain in your low back. So do that version for right now. And then, you know, test out lifting up a little bit every once in a while. And at some point you may find that it becomes more comfortable. But I'm a very big proponent of the yoga concept or the, yeah, the yoga philosophy concept of ahimsa, which means that we should practice yoga in a way that doesn't cause any harm, meaning any pain in the body. So please, I encourage you to modify your yoga postures so that you're doing them in a way that doesn't cause you any pain. Yeah, so keep your forearms down. You'll still get the benefit of the hips stretching out in the glutes on one side, stretching out in the hip flexor on the other side, but you won't have the pain in your back. Practice it that way for now. And then, yeah, gradually you can start to add a little bit more intensity to it. Give yourself permission to do what feels good for your body. Yes, that's exactly right. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, it's a very um, foreign concept, I think. Uh, to many people, not just in yoga, but in like exercise or fitness or any kind of physical, physical activity in general, we okay. feel that we need to do the maximum. We feel that we need to do what the teacher is asking or demonstrating, but we should keep in mind that all of our bodies are built differently. Um, we all have a different history, like a uh, history of our body. Like some of us have had C-sections, some of us, you know, have herniated discs, like we all have different things going on in the body. And so what the yoga teacher who's standing in the front of the room or, you know, in front of the camera, whatever they're teaching may or may not be 100% appropriate for you. So listen to your body, practice in a way that is not causing you any pain or any harm. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I try to be conscious in my videos to demonstrate a version of the posture that is accessible. Um, you know, when the yoga teacher is demonstrating the most physically challenging version of the posture, 
all of the class starts to feel that they need to do that version as well. Like, you know, on some subconscious level, we feel some kind of peer pressure that we need to do it, but we really don't. Um, you know, I was talking earlier about advanced practice and subtle aspects of the practice. To me, you know, a person is an advanced practitioner of yoga when they can really listen to their body and not do the thing that is, harm, you know, that can cause pain or harm. So, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult thing. It takes, I think, a lot of time, a lot of experience, um, and a lot of confidence to be able to do something in a different way than what the teacher is teaching. Yeah, but just know that it's perfectly fine, and you can do it. And um, yeah, and it, and and we make mistakes too. Sometimes we get a little carried away, and we want to do try something, and then the next day you know, we're paying for it and we're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that thing. So sometimes we have to make a few mistakes before we learn the lesson and learn how to practice in a way that is more gentle and more um, kind to your body. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that question. I do like pigeon pose. Um, it does have lots of benefits. It also has lots of ways that you can modify it. Um, maybe I'll do a video on that one day. There's lots of ways to modify it to make it work better for different kinds of bodies. Okay, great. Thank y'all for hanging out with me today. Do y'all have any last questions before we wrap it up? Wrap it up. I'm feeling better now than I did at the beginning of this live stream. <laughs> I think I still have fever, but not, not nauseous at the moment. So that's good. Yeah. Anyone else have, uh, has, have any of the rest of you had both of your COVID vaccines? How long did your symptoms and your side effects last? I'm hoping this is going to go away today and tomorrow I'll be fine. Uh, okay. I don't know. Sometimes people are typing and it takes a little while for it to actually show up here. All right. Well, I guess that's it for today, everybody. Um, let me see what's coming up next. So I owe you links to... Um, my yoga therapy slash coaching and I owe you a link for classes and I gave you that code so that you can come and take a class for free. Um, yeah, come try out a class. It'll be fun. Um, yeah, we have, I always start the, like we have kind of a, uh, a thing that we teachers all do in my studio. We start our live streams. I mean, our live streams, our class, our zoom classes, about 10 to 15 minutes before the class time so that we have time to chat and stuff. And we're really building a nice community, not only of our local people in Round Rock, but all the people who are attending our Zoom classes now from around the world. So that's really neat. Like friendships are being formed by people who are not even, you know, in the same city. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, Catherine says it depends on which version you receive uh, the COVID vaccine. Yeah, I had Pfizer. Um, but yeah, still having these these symptoms. <laughs> How do we access the class? Okay, I will. Um, I'm going to put a link in the description box here. Um, I think that's what you mean. Like, how do you register? I'll put the link for you. And then once you register for the class, you'll receive an email from us with the Zoom link, so that you can just you know click on that at the time of the class and um, attend the class. And then if you're not able to attend live after the class is done, everyone who has registered for it, we email you uh, the link to the recording so that you have that and you can actually save it or download it or whatever and keep it if you want to so that you can practice it again in the future. Yeah. Oh, I just got the second dose Wednesday. Luckily, oh yeah, I got the second dose on Wednesday too. Uh, but lots of symptoms, <laughs> sadly. Okay, love your videos for bigger bodies. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, um, Denise, the lady who has done a lot of those videos with me, um, is enthusiastic to help with more videos. Uh, she's kind of you know, really excited. She's she's happy to to like participate in this because. <laughs> She knows the benefits that people are getting from it. And oftentimes when people comment under the video, I send her screenshots of them and she feels like just really happy to be, uh, you know, helping to make yoga accessible and helping encourage people to practice yoga. Um, you know, when they have a body shape that's similar to Denise's that, you know, it's inspiring for her and for me too. So I'm glad that you like those. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm glad uh, Tomar and I, 
curious to know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, yeah, I'm excited for some of you all to come and attend a class with me. So I teach on Monday. I'll just wrap up with this. On Mondays, I teach at noon central time. It's a moderate class. And on Wednesdays at nine o'clock um, central time, I teach another moderate class. And at 1030 on Wednesdays, I teach um, yoga for bigger bodies. So those are the three classes I teach. But I have a team of teachers and, you know, together we teach classes every day of the week. So you can look at the class schedule and decide which one you want to sign up for. Uh, oh, one last detail. Let me tell you about signing up for the class. You'll, you're going to like add to your cart or whatever. Like if you were trying to purchase a single class and then once you have that, then you can type in the promo code so that you can get it for free. Okay. Both vaccines, Moderna. Yeah. I have heard that that uh, Moderna, you get like worse symptoms. <laughs> Okay, yeah, hopefully we'll all recover from this and then we'll all be protected from COVID and we can start to return to something that more closely resembles life before the pandemic. Okay, well, thank you very much, all of you, for being here with me today and, you know, sharing this discussion and participating so much in the chat. I really appreciate it. And I'm happy to, you know, have been able to share this information, this more subtle kind of you know, information about strengthening and back pain. And hopefully it um, was informative and beneficial for you. All right. Well, thank you again. Have a great day. And I will see you next week on Friday where we'll talk about something new. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody.